Welcome to our next talk. Uh, hopefully, if you're competing in the demo party contest, you submitted it. Otherwise, you have like 90 seconds. So, good luck. Uh, you, by now, I think all the teams have done the room, so good luck to all of them. Um, next up, we have Ghostwood doing yet another DDoS talk. Thank you. Apparently, I'm new to microphones as well. Okay. Cool. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so another year, another DDoS talk. So why am I saying this? Well, first, that's a topic that has been discussed quite a lot lately, and there's a lot of hype, a lot of bullshit. Um, and um, also, I've been kind of repeating this talk, and every year I'm bringing in new updates, so pretty much I'm redoing the talk, trying to step on some of the things I kind of dis described in the previous talks. So um, kind of that's what it is about. Uh, now, before I continue, uh, if you have any problems understanding me, just let me know. Um, and I'll try to speak either slow or explain more. Uh, unfortunately, I can't get rid of the accent on a short notice. Uh, but <laughs> we'll, we'll work with that. So uh, what do I do? Um, I work, currently work for a DDoS mitigation um, vendor uh, with wall balancers and DDoS mitigation equipment. Uh, in the past, um, I did a lot of consulting in that space for uh, Cisco, uh, as well as I kind of ran the edge infrastructure for Yahoo and uh, uh, had some time before that at another large company uh, that does web services. Um, so I'm kind of acquainted with the topic. Uh, so, let's see, uh, what are we going to cover today? So, I'm going to go over some of the general concepts of what DDoS is, and then I'll uh, focus in particular on what has been uh, popular over the last uh, year. Now, uh, if we want to do an exhaustive talk on DDoS, that will, that will take a week of training and still won't cover most of it. So, uh, I'll just focus on the few things that, that are kind of repeating, that are the refrain over the last year. And um, if you have any questions regarding other DDoS types, we can either cover that in the Q&A or if we have uh, time at the end of this session. I have some backup slides that I can also use for that. Um, so what is the DDoS? Uh, let's, let's try to make this more interactive. I don't want everybody to fall asleep on me right after lunch and after you know, a few other talks. So what is the DDoS? Jeremy. It's your denial of service. Okay, so what does that mean to you? You're overflowing or uh, overloading a pipe, some sort of connection with multiple connections from a bunch of zombies or what have you. Okay, cool. So he mentioned a couple of things, overloading the pipe and then multiple connections. So those are two different different um, dimensions. One of them is the pipe itself is a, resor is a resource or the bandwidth that you have available to a particular uh, website. Now, the second thing is connections. So you can take down a website based on a number of connections without overloading the pipe. And this is very important to notice because um, there is not only one type of DDoS. In general, with DDoS, uh, the attacker is focusing on exhausting a particular resource. And all of the resources are chained to each other. So in a chain, what is the weakest link? Well, oh sorry, how weak, is it, uh, how weak is a chain? Well, it is as strong as its weakest link. So it's similar with DDoS. If you can find a particular component that can be exploited and overwhelmed, then the entire, uh, the entire house of cards falls down. So um, in general, this is resource exhaustion. And uh, now I want you to consider how is that different from having your website featured on a uh, large media site and suddenly drawing huge amount of traffic? The intent. Exactly, the intent. From te but from technology point of view, no difference. Um, in some cases, there may be difference depending on the approach that's used to, to, to create the you know, service. But um, in particular, you're just going to end up not being able to provide service to your users. And this is what really is important in this particular case. Now, from security point of view, um, a DDoS is a uh, decreased availability. Um, if you're a CISSP or the like, this will be one of the three things in the triangle there. Um, if you're an operations guy, this will be just an outage. Uh, why is that important? Well, a couple of things. When you're trying to deal with DDoS and prepare your infrastructure for DDoS, you'll be talking to C-types. And those people um, don't understand SIM packets. They don't understand connections per second in most cases. 
what they understand is money and the money that they're going to lose. So it's very important to be able to frame what DDoS is for those types. So, you know, from security point of view, no availability and outage for the operations people. Now, uh, the difference between DDoS and DOS, um, that's kind of thing that has been repeated over and over again. Uh, over the past, uh, it was implied that if it is a DDoS, you know, this is the biggest, the bigger thing than DOS. Now, last year, somebody came with the, uh, what was it? It was DDRDOS or something like this, which was a reflected DDoS, which, you know, again, somebody's trying to come up with more terms. But what does that mean to you? It means either more traffic or less traffic in the past. Nowadays, eh, not quite that way. And why? Um, let's look at the next slide, uh, and I'll try to explain that. So in the past, we had an attacker which was controlling a CNC. Uh, and issuing commands to a large uh, army of bots or zombies, as Jeremy called them. Uh, then they would deliver the attack traffic to the victim. Over the past couple of years, there can be, has been a proliferation of so-called reflective attacks or reflected attacks. Uh, those attacks operate slightly differently. So you have a single attacker that is originating the attacking traffic, but they are using a large number of misconfigured systems that are in... Uh, in turn going to send traffic to the victim directly. So you don't really need to have a CNC because some of the uh, ratios of amplification, are, uh, of amplification are on the order of 50. So if you have one gigabit connection to the internet and if you can fill it up, that means that you can produce 50 gigabits of uh, reflected traffic towards your victim. Uh, so does it really matter if it is DOS or DDoS or do you call the second thing uh, DDoS really or is it you know, just single machine that is infected sending traffic to reflectors. That doesn't really matter. The, the effect is the amount of traffic you're getting. So uh, looking at bandwidth, attack bandwidth um, over the past. So 2010, uh, we had a little over uh, 100G. Uh, it was a particular government site that was, that was attacked at the time. Um, then in 2011, um, traffic went slightly higher and uh, then went to 300, and then last year, so sorry, I have a little mistake here on the slide. Uh, the year before was, was 300, last year was 400, um, and does that really matter? So as bandwidth on the internet is increasing, um, those numbers don't really mean anything, uh, because, you know, 100 gigs at, in 2010 was quite a lot nowadays, having in mind that um, each of the companies probably has quadrupled their connectivity to the internet, the transit providers has, have gone more than 10, 20 times what they had at the time, those numbers will continue growing. Again, does that really matter? Not quite. What really matters is um, the amount of financial damage to a particular entity that they're suffering um, through a denial of service. Uh, now, who is suffering the damage? Kind of curious if you can think about that. So one of them is obvious. That would be the target site. Let's say um, Amazon.com goes down. That's the obvious. Who else is suffering? Co-hosted systems. Co -hosted systems. Co -hosted systems? OK, so if you have a system that is uh, in a co-location or in a data center or virtual hosting, uh, sorry, um, or hosted services provider, uh, other instances will suffer. What else? Okay, customers trying to get the, their data, uh, but technically they are a derivative of the site that is being attacked. So, yes, uh huh. The merchants, okay. Do the transit providers that have to transit this bandwidth suffer? Or do they make money out of it? That's part of the problem. Why, why, why are some of the problems not solved here? Well, for all those transit providers, this is just more traffic that they're transporting. They're char charging 90 or 90 percent percentile of the traffic. The more DDoS, the more they charge. I'm not saying that they're intentionally sponsoring DDoS. I'm just saying is that they have certain reluctance or looking at their economic model. It is not that expensive to have DDoS for as long as you can transport it without going down. When you are average, when you're an average provider in the U.S., you have well over 100G transit, well over that. So, you know, most of the DDoSes you can transport without a problem. So, uh, think, you know, that's one thing to kind of look at. And you see that there's very simple ways that you can 
uh, resolve some of the DDoSs. Sorry, I had a malfunction here. Um, but uh, you know, some of the large providers are not that uh, willing to, to to focus on that. And also, you know, from their point of view, there's also some legislation that prevents them uh, from inspecting the traffic. Uh, so so it's it's a little bit more complicated there. Um, so uh, what are the contributing factors? Um, this year, the unpatched embedded devices uh, pretty much are topping the chart. A um, couple of years ago, I mentioned those as being on the rise, being a very interesting vector to use as uh, reflectors for, DDoS attack, uh, for DNS uh, reflected DDoS attacks. Now they have become uh, pretty much the primary tool. Um, if you remember the attacks against Xbox and Sony over the holidays, now this is all public information, Brian Krebs uh, wrote about it. Those were all coming from um, devices that um, were basically home gateways or modems. Um, there were a few particular um, vendors that were quoted in that article. Um, since I work for a vendor, it will not be cool for me to mention other vendors screwing it up seriously, but I would encourage you to go and look at those vendors and see who they are, because then I'll encourage you to look at some other things later in my talk, which will be pointing to potentially the same vendors. And then you can kind of see some questions that will arise from that. Um, so, uh, the, yeah, as I said, um, the unpatched embedded devices, which are um, in a way also available reflectors, but it, the, the available reflectors for uh, NTP and uh, DNS and SSDP are not only home devices. Uh, then uh, the uh, unpatched content management systems like uh, Joomla, WordPress, those are also uh, a contributing factor, though they have kind of fallen out of favor. They don't give you a lot of bang for the buck. There's a kind of more work than you need to do. You actually have to exploit those. You have to write scripts to embed a PHP script or Perl script or something else there. With the reflectors, you just send them a query and then they respond back with amplification. And I'll go in more details uh, how this thing work, works. Um, another problem is hosting providers that allow, uh, that allow reflection. Um, so again, going back to the providers, the large scale service providers. Um, for the ones that are transit providers, this is just more money because they're transporting more traffic. For the ones that uh, give you hosting, this is just more customers that are willing to pay 100 to 200 dollars a month to have a machine that is connected to the internet over one gig connection with no outbound filtering, so they can spoof anything they want. Um, so, oh, sorry. And overall, as I mentioned, there's more bandwidth available. Now, who is the adversary? That's kind of obvious. Um, the only thing that's kind of different is that there's more and more gamers that are involved in that. So it, it appears to be very popular for people to uh, deny of service uh, other people that uh, may be performing better than them in a particular game. I personally don't quite get that because if, you know, if you're competing with somebody in the game, you should be competing there, not outside of it. Um, there's also a fairly large number of professional DDoS operators. Um, those are the so-called booters, which provide that uh, as a service. Uh, we'll look a little bit more into what they do. There's also a um, very large number of uh, groups that in one way or another are backed uh, by, uh, by particular states. Um, you can think of some of the attacks that we experienced um, about two years ago, uh, mostly against the financial system, and uh, potentially look at maybe a correlation with particular country being kicked out of SWIFT. Um, so that, that kind of gives you a little bit more answers to that. Um, now to summarize, pretty much everyone and uh, their relatives. So, okay, skill level. So the skill level has always been kind of low. Uh, over the past year, there have been a couple of samples that uh, malware, uh, malware must die and some of the other uh, sites that do reversing looked at, uh, which are becoming more and more complex, uh, including, you know, uh, fairly well written code in um, languages that are not that popular amongst the script, script kiddies. Uh, also, uh, we're seeing a lot of advanced uh, CNC uh, to some of those. So um, it looks like uh, people are taking it seriously, at least on the offensive side. So that's one of the things that kind of changed over the last year, year and a half. And um, as always, there has been a fairly strong um, um, segmentation of the market between the two smiths and the people that are actually using those tools. Um, and uh, the two smiths just, you know, make money out of selling those kits. They can vary between, you know, $50, $60 to three, $400. Um, and um, 
then somebody else goes and uses them. Now, motivation, financial, um, can also be used to suppress speech. Uh, so in particular, uh, there have been a number of documented cases where um, the attacks have been um, attributed to China, uh, and they have been against Tibet Tibetan activists or other groups uh, that are um, trying to send their message out. Um, in some cases, attacks have been used to divert attention, uh, and this is no longer the case, but still some companies suffer that. Um, in the past, many companies would have their web presence on the same internet connection as uh, their corp company or their corporate offices, and they would normally host their web servers uh, inside the corporation. Um, this is not the case for most companies nowadays, but um, the ones that still do, um, when they have a large data exfiltration event, if it is covered by a DDoS, they cannot see the traffic easily going out. Um, but again, I'm kind of calling this out because it was used in the past. It potentially can be used nowadays, but um, the trend is kind of going down. Uh, now, what's newish? So I mentioned booters, the uh, stressors, and uh, the embedded devices. Uh, before I continue, any questions so far? Okay, cool. Uh, so fortunately, I'm not very good in, uh, in PowerPoint, so I have to play those for you. Uh, but I think a picture is worth a thousand words, so I'll try with this one. DDO service. We are here to provide you a cheap professional DDO. Hello hackers, I am promoting Guapo's professional DDO service. We are here to provide you a cheap professional DDO service. As you can see, uh, this, this can hardly be any more cheesy. Uh, <laughs> um, also, the person in particular doesn't probably even have an idea what DDoS is. Uh, uh, but, you know, because people would not pronounce it this way. But anyway, uh, you can see kind of what this is about. Another one. And I'm here to promote Backwoods Professional Cheap DDoS Service. It's strong, fast, and trusted with no time. Strong, fast, and so on. That looks like an um, ad for a pill. Um, and... <laughs> So, so, but you, you get the point. You, you get the point of who the, those ads are targeting. Um, now, actually, this guy started with something that I find much more hip. Uh, so you're here for one reason, and that reason is, is because you need your business competitors, rivals, haters, or whatever the reason is, or who, they are to go down. Well, you, my friend, you've came to the right place. If you want your business competitors to go down, well, they can. Okay. So you see the evolution. He starts with the more commercial stuff, uh, and he kind of appears like somebody that has a little bit more clue. Uh, and then we end up with the cheesy marketing, which apparently was more suitable for the uh, clientele that he uh, seemed to be attracting. So anyway, uh, laughing at that, those services can produce somewhere on the order between 5 to 10 gigs to 20 to 50 gigs per second. That's not a joke for most companies that are going to be defending against that. Now, um, what's interesting is that the booters normally run their attacks within 3, 5, 7. Usually, they don't get to 10 minutes. Can somebody guess why? I have a couple of speculations. So the first one is MRTG graphs usually run on five minutes and they average their results. So if you want to be under the radar and not be shut down easily and then have to rebuild your um, server somewhere else, you have to stay below that so that it doesn't look very, you know, very big on the graph uh, of your provider. Now, the other reason is that those mostly cater to people that play games. If I want to take somebody offline while I'm playing World of Warcraft, or what was the other one that Riot has, I don't need more than five minutes of DDoS. Because the person is out, I won the game, that's it. So I think you know, that's, those are the two reasons. But the, the thing is that they don't usually last more than five minutes. Uh, and again, this should not be um, underestimated, because those are you know, kids that do that with pocket change money, those kits usually run between 
fifty to up to two three hundred dollars uh, on the black market, then you buy hosting for another sixty to hundred dollars. So that's fairly cheap to get into. Um, now, if somebody wants to cause real damage, they can get much more resources uh, and uh, do that using using the exact same tools. Um, so that's um, that's pretty much about the booters. Now, home routers. So that's a completely different story. Um, as I mentioned, there are particular um, two or three vendors, uh, uh, kind of in Asia. There um, won't be specific, uh, but. Um, Default passwords, admin admin or admin password or something like this. Those those lists can be found on the internet. Um, some of them have open DNS uh, recursive DNS resolvers that cannot even be disabled, and those are on the internet interface, not on the um, on the home on, on the office side. Um, and uh, last week there was also another bug that just came you know that came out uh, in the NetBS, uh, NetUSB module, which allows you to uh, remotely uh, get onto the box. In most of those cases, the mode of operation is fairly simple. Uh, they um, log into the device and install a script, and this script listens to commands or pose a CNC. Sometimes uh, you need to hit the device and execute the script with certain parameters, or the, in the other case, the script would pull the CNC server and execute commands. In the second case, uh, in particular with the Xbox attacks, um, the, the scripts were also deleted after they were executed, so it was very difficult to do forensics on those because uh, the script did not exist on the file system anymore. Um, and um, pretty simple, um, you know, doesn't seem like somebody put a lot of effort into those, but it's a fairly powerful weapon. So uh, I'm just kind of speculating if I was to be a state-backed manufacturer and if I wanted to create a bunch of cheap, you know, weaponry and distribute it around the world, how would I do that? I'm not saying they're doing that. I'm just saying if I was to be, you know, hypothetically, what I would do. So, um, you know, another question to kind of think about. Um, and um, that's what I'm saying. Follow the money. See who benefits from all those bugs and exploits that kind of come into those devices. Now, looking at the attack surface, so I'll, I'll kind of switch to more technical uh, now uh, because I'm sure you're tired of the general BS. Um, you can look at the different network layers. Attacks can pretty much happen in any of those layers. Um, now, one general rule that I have observed over time is that the lower the layer the attack is uh, using, the more compute intensive it is. So, or, uh, so let's say if we have a SIN flood, it will result in a lot of SIN packets going to, from one machine to another, a lot of bandwidth, high bandwidth utilization. Um, and then in order to mitigate this, you have to generate SIN cookies and so on and so on, which is pretty, pretty um, compute intensive and network intensive. Now, the higher level the, the, the attacks are, the less network bandwidth you see. So for example, if you have an XML expansion attack, you send a small XML snippet which hits the server, then the server interprets this and suddenly blows its memory footprint and crashes. Um, so that's kind of a general rule. It's not always the case, but uh, uh, you know, uh, most cases it is true. Uh, or slow worries. For example, slow worries, um, you can send one packet every you know, 50 seconds and still keep a connection occupied for a very, very long time. Um, so very low network resource utilization. You can't see that on the network graphs, but then the servers are rendered uh, inoperable. And in this case, also the CPU on the servers will be really low. They'll be just out of our descriptors, um, so or sockets. Okay, um. so reflection and amplification attack. There are two different concepts. One of them is reflection. The other one is amplification. Um, the reflector types, uh, you know, the popular ones are DNS, SSDP, NTP. There's some SNMP. Um, hasn't, for some reason, didn't stick much. It showed up, then disappeared, then showed up again. Uh, maybe because DNS and SSDP are so sweet that there's no point in doing SNMP. Um, you can read more on the implication factors at the US CERT uh, publication that is quoted there. And it's at the bottom of the screen right now as well. Uh, the link is at the bottom. So uh, look at the different amplification factors. So for DNS, they're looking at 28 to 54. Um, I think actually it can be higher than that if DNSSEC is enabled. I haven't played with, with it myself, but it, it, it can be higher theoretically. Um, 
NTP 500 time amplification. So think about one gigabit. Um, if you can deliver this unfiltered to the target, we're looking at 500 gigabits. That's something to kind of think about. Okay, so what is a reflected attack or reflection attack? You have an unwilling intermediary uh, in some way involved in it and they will deliver the traffic for the attacker. Uh, so the attacker will send a packet. Usually it happens over UDP. Uh, though there are some cases where you can use, let's say, the WordPress ping back, which is over TCP, but, you know, that's a little more complicated. Um, thus, it's not worth it putting more effort when you can do it in a way as simple as the one I'm showing right now. So over UDP, you spoof your source IP address with the one of the victim, send it to a machine, it responds back, and the traffic goes to the victim. So this is the reflection part. Now, let's look at how DNS resolution works. We have the so-called authoritative and uh, recursive uh, DNS servers. And the problem in particular is the open recursive servers. So if we want to resolve a particular DNS name, we'll have the user send a query to the res recursive resolver. Then the recursive resolver goes on the cloud. Or for the other ones here, it was also called the internet five years ago. <laughs> And then we have authoritative servers. First, we have the root authoritative, then we have the .com authoritative, then we have the ATM authoritative server. So the recursive will sequentially query all of those. And once it has the answer, or it has no answer, it's going to respond to the, cust uh, to the, to the user. If it has no answer, it will just send an NX record. Uh, if it has an answer, it's going to cache the answer and send the answer back to the user. So looking at DNS at packet level, so the same thing, but now looking at how the packets would look. If the answer is cached, it immediately responds. Now, if the answer is not cached, the recursive resolver will send one query to the root, one query to the com, one query to the A10 DNS servers, and then the result will go back. And actually, in effect, it sends two or three uh, for redundancy, but you know, just logically, that's what, what happens. Now, if I wanted to use um, the recursive server for reflection, which mode of operation would I choose to use? If I wanted to spoof my, qu my question to 333, when will I get a higher rate, response rate? Hmm? Yeah, well, it's all happening over UDP, but from the, looking at those two cases, Yes, exactly, because it already has the answer. I send it a question, it immediately comes back with an answer. Um, okay, so what the DNS reflection attack looks like, it was very simple. I am sending a query to somebody. Can you see the mouse? It's showing on the screen. So, see, this is not my IP, this is my victim. Then this recursive resolver answers to that particular server with the answer to my question. Now, what if I was to send this query to many, many more servers? Well, I get many, many more answers going to my victim. Now, let's put that on the table for a second and look at this query. Um, I'm asking for any record for isc.org at 333. Well, the answer is something like this. It intentionally is overflowing the screen. It actually continues like seven, eight more screens. So, if I was to ask this question, I would get a really, really big answer going to my victim. And what you just saw is also amplification. So I have reflection and amplification. So in other words, the amplification part is I send a small piece of information to somebody and then I get much more. And this is where those amplification ratios uh, are important in the table that I show you from US CERT. You know, you can have amplification up to 500 times. Uh, which protocols are uh, kind of uh, susceptible to that DNS, NTP, uh, SSDP, SNMP, and another watch list. Now, going back to the DNS case. So if I was to be a, a victim of a DNS attack, what would I do? Not only if it's reflected, if I just have a DNS server and somebody is aiming at my DNS server, what can I do? Well, I can first validate if the packet is valid. Um, I can also whitelist particular valid machines that are going to be answering 
but that's a little bit more complicated because uh, in the first place, I do not know what my users will be asking. Um, but again, it's possible to a certain extent. Um, I can also do some kind of validation and only validation passes, then I add them onto the whitelist and then I service those queries. Um, we can do, we can issue challenges, uh, which is, you know, part of the validation process. And um, we can also use some high performance equipment that is going to do the job instead of the DNS server. Um, and uh, last thing here is um, I can also have a predefined list of known um, open DNS uh, recursive resolvers that are used for reflection or that can be used for reflection. And in the case of an attack, I can just start dropping all traffic from those. Now, uh, here I'm working with the assumption that I have fairly large amount of bandwidth going to my DNS servers because if I don't, uh, my bandwidth will be overwhelmed. So remember about the bottleneck. If you know, if my bottleneck is the DNS server, I can use all those things to mitigate. If my bottleneck is the bandwidth going to this DNS server, I'm pretty screwed at that point. So I just have to uh, wait for somebody upstream, like my provider, to do the mitigation for me. Uh, now, speaking of challenges, uh, why do I bring this topic, and in particular DNS? DNS is one of those protocols that's somewhat interesting because, uh, actually, let's go over this and then we'll, we'll look at the conclusion. So the DNS challenge looks like this. If a server asks a question, and we suspect that this may not be a legitimate question, then we're going to respond with a C name instead of providing the answer. And the C name will have something funny here, which actually is a hash. Um, and then only if this machine on the other end responds with a question trying to resolve what that C name is, only then I know that they're a legit customer or a legit user. So only then I'll provide the answer to this and potentially put them on a whitelist. Now, let's compare this mode of operation to me immediately answering the query, even if this is a fake DNS server. What did just happen here? Well, unfortunately, I have two times the amount of traffic two times the packet rate, and on top of that, I have to calculate some hashes and other stuff, which is additional compute that I have to exert. So unlike all of the other DDoS types, DNS is, has its specifics, and in particular, it's much more, import, uh, much more expensive to mitigate than to outperform the attacker or to service the queries. So keep that in mind. DNS actually turns to be the Achilles heel in most cases. Um, so. Okay, that was the point about DNS. Uh, now, another way to mitigate, uh, if you have more infrastructure uh, and you're kind of like at the service provider level is to use Anycast. So um, how does Anycast work? You can have, you know, with Unicast, you have single IP address mapped to a, a machine, to a single machine. Or in the base case, you can have a load balancer and multiple servers, but all of those have to be in the exact same physical location, the same data center. With any case, this is not the case. No, what you have there is you can have multiple locations. Actually, I have to catch up with the slide. So you have one location, and all of the customers or attackers will be attacking that location. With any cast, you can have multiple physical locations, and each of them is going to advertise this particular IP space. Uh, what will happen in this case is that different attackers will be drawn to the closest or routed to the closest physical location. So is any cast making sense? This is particularly easy to do with DNS because it's stateless. Even if routes are moving around, that there will be no outages. Um, some companies do that with TCP as well. Uh, I personally don't see a problem. Some of the kind of older fellows uh, think that uh, TCP over any cast is a problem, but I don't think nowadays that that really is an issue. So that's a way to, to scale traffic. Uh, now, if you were to be running a reflector, um, or if you need for some reason to run a open DNS resolver, uh, it may be useful to rate limit the responses that you provide to different customers. With bind, this is how the configuration would look like. Now, why would somebody want to run a open DNS resolver? To provide services to someone else, okay. So they may have mobile workforce. And for some reason, they may want to give them static DNS servers to, to use. I mean, it's possible. Or, or you can be potentially Google DNS or Open DNS, uh, which are basing their model on this kind of operation. Of course, you could be, you know, uh, state-backed uh, hardware manufacturer, 
uh, or what am I talking about? Uh, Okay, uh, and now from security point of view, if you do not want to rate limit and if you actually do not want to provide uh, DNS service to the internet, you can just uh, create an access list in bind which will look kind of like this. And this will limit uh, what IP addresses this bind server responds to. Um, so, pretty simple stuff there. Okay, NTP, my favorite. So, NTP. Um, is one of those protocols that uh, you can definitely see was designed bef long, long, long time ago. And people were really good at heart when they designed it. Uh, it has the concept of a stratum, uh, a stratum server. So the, the higher the stratum is, the further away this server is, or the higher the number of the stratum is, the further away this server is from a uh, really precise time. And um, it ah, this protocol allows you to to, to get the time from a centralized server. So I didn't say that, but I think it's kind of obvious uh, network time protocol. So um, how does that work? We have a, let's say, stratum one servers that are on the internet. Then you have the corporate NTP server, which can query those. And then the users will go and query the corp NTP servers and they get their time. Um, I think Apple, for some reason, had their server for very long time, seven minutes off. I'm not sure why, but uh, you know, all of the iPhones would be those boxes here on the side, querying the that server, which is querying the other servers. Uh, so, uh, in one of the older implementations, um, I guess it was useful to allow a systems administrator to remotely query the NTP server and see what clients have ever asked this NTP server for the time. Um, Maybe it had some application in the past, uh, but uh, right now it doesn't have legitimate one and the application you see is pretty funny. So um, if you have the system administrator, they make the query and they, they get a copy of those two IP addresses that have, um, that have queried the time server. Now, what will happen if it was a spoofed IP address or the query came from a spoofed IP address? Well, the answer would go to the victim Okay, now here we have only two IP addresses that have ever queried the NTP server, right? So, you know, the amplification is not that big. Now, in the current implementation, uh, the cache can be up to 600 entries. So 600 entries multiplied by four bytes for the IPv4, uh, that will be the reflection that comes back. Jeremy, was that the question? Yeah, I okay. wondered how long it holds back after a little bit of flood. Oh, forever. Okay, so yeah, think about that. And so anyway, uh, the resolution is very simple. Just disable the monolist command. Um, and also you can limit with access lists. Uh, I didn't want to come with all the different configurations because it would like blow through like four slides. You can go to King, Team Camry's website. Uh, they have uh, templates for Juniper, Cisco, and um, um, ISC NTP or whatever was the open source one that's fairly popular. Um, you can also look at the list of NTP refractors, uh, which was maintained by the open NTP project uh, at the very bottom. Okay, um, going back to DNS again, um, there's a, a, an attack that's fairly old, but kind of started surfacing again over the last three, three six months, pretty much since the beginning of the year. So. Let's look at how DNS resolution works again. We have the user asking the recursive resolver a question. The recursive resolver goes on the internet and asks the question to different authoritatives and then comes back with the answer. Now, remember that the recursive resolver also caches the queries. That means that if we have a network of 100 machines working through one DNS resolver, once this resolver decides to go, once one of those clients decides to go to google.com, this answer will be cached for, let's say, five minutes, and everybody else on that network that wants to go to google.com is going to use the answer from the uh, recursive resolver, from the cache of the recursive resolver. So um, looking at DNS, the bulk of the queries are being answered at the very bottom at, by the recursive resolvers, and they answer out of their caches. So this is how it's possible for a fairly small numbers, a number of servers to be servicing the .com domains, because the dot com answers will be 
cached in the lower layer uh, or in the recursive servers and they'll be, uh, they'll be using those caches. Now, what if I decide to do the following? I ask for a random domain that doesn't exist. Then the recursive will send that to the authoritative for com. Then I ask for another random domain and so on. So right now, every single query that I send to the recursive is also related to the authoritative. Now, what if I decide to use another recursive in parallel? And rinse and repeat. What is going to happen with the authoritative? Well, it's going to get a lot more traffic that it is designed to handle. Um, so that's, a put, that's one of the attacks that has been surfacing lately when people are trying to take down the authoritative servers uh, versus taking down some company's DNS server. Uh, those attacks can also be um, forwarded against the company server as well. So, for example, you can have random string dot google.com, random string dot google.com, and so on. So, this, this is going to terminate attacking the Google's DNS servers and so on. Okay, so um, in all of those attacks, uh, basically, um, you can kind of look at the mitigation. So, if you have to defend yourself, you can do any cast, you can deploy very expensive DDoS mitigation equipment. Um, you can kind of tune your architecture. Now, if you have to defend other people, if you are the reflector and you are defending other people, you can apply rate limiting, uh, BCP38, which is a, a, an RFC that defines how to configure outbound filtering so that you are not a reflector and that you cannot spoof tra traffic. And uh, you can also, you know, configure properly your DNS, uh, SNMP, uh, sorry, um, NTP and SNMP servers. Um, so, kind of, if you look between those two, the the ones that are required to defend a company are fairly expensive. And on the other hand, if you have to protect the internet from yourself, uh, those are first very cheap to implement, and second, um, they're just a matter of you know best practices. So if you do your job right, you are not going to be a reflector. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that it's very important for companies to also look at their own resources, not only think what they're going to do if, they're, if they get attacked, but also make sure that they themselves are not reflectors and are not being used in attacks. Um, so that's pretty much it, I think. Um, hey, I'm ahead of time. Okay, questions? I must have explained everything very, very well. <laughs> okay. You, you, one of your examples you listed isc.org. Yes. Okay, that's the Internet Storm Center, right? No, that's not the Internet. Uh, this is uh, Internet Software Corporation. Uh, and um, the reason this query is there because this was the first time that this type of attack was um, observed in very large scale. This was in the beginning of 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were trying to take down ISC. Now, why is that uh, interesting? Well, ISC is one of the companies that is running one of the root DNS servers. Um, so that was one of the reasons. There were also other political reasons because ISC was also involved in some other initiatives that people, I guess, did not like or they did not like particular people within ISC. There were a lot of speculations there. Why did they have so much uh, traffic regardless of this is a simple query? Hmm? What was all the information or all the data returned into the query? Oh, so, so when you ask an, uh, an any query, or any, uh, so in DNS, you can ask for a record or PTR record. In one case, you get name to IP address translation. In the other case, IP to name. And there's a bunch of other records. Um, and when you request, when you, when you send an any query, you get all records for that particular resource. There's it's questionable if there's any value to any queries, um, and many resolvers nowadays in their default configuration do not do not provide that as a functionality. But at the time, this was pretty much um, um, standard. And also note, um, the fact that they were using isc.org as a name doesn't mean that the attack was directed at them. It meant that somebody was naming isc.org, somebody was trying to send the message, because the attack was actually against somebody else. They were just using the isc zone Nowadays, criminals, uh, what they would do is they would um, 
create a um, specially crafted zone with very large records. So when they send an any query, they're going to get very uh, big amplification. With ISC, they were not getting that much amplification as if they ha as if they would as, as they would be getting if they created a custom zone. But it was uh, a tribal war, so uh, somebody was sending the message there because ISC did something before that. So. Um, yeah. Questions? Other questions? Yes? How effective are some of these anti DDoS services like Toxic? Okay, so the question is how effective are some of the DDoS um, uh, scrubbing services? Um, so that's one of the things I didn't cover today, but uh, there are a couple of ways you can deal with DDoS mitigation. One of them is you can buy expensive equipment and bend with and defend, it, uh, defend yourself. The other one is uh, you can pay to somebody else to have your traffic rerouted through them, cleaned up, and then they send the clean traffic back home. So those are fairly effective, um, just because those people do that daily and they know what they're doing. Um, however, there are certain downsides. Uh, first of them is cost. It's not cheap in some of those cases. Um, you know, it, the, the bills can really go fairly high. And, and then you have to draw your line and see, say, okay, for an, an hour of outage on my website, I am losing, let's say, $20,000 because of lost e-commerce. Um, and I'm paying prolexic $30,000 for you know, this mitigation, then you may figure out that it's much cheaper to actually be offline than pay for mitigation. Uh, now, for some companies, that's also a matter of um, branding. So being down, their website being down is not good. So how you account for that is, is very difficult. I mean, it's kind of difficult, depends on the company. I have not been able to find a, a specific number from any of the companies I have worked with. If I ask them from point of view of reputation, how much does an hour of outage cost you? Nobody has been able to provide that answer. Um, so those, those um, services are effective, but they, they're costly. Some of them uh, actually make you pay based on clean traffic. Some of them make you pay on the attack traffic. And again, this depends how much clean traffic you get normally. Now, in some cases like gaming providers, it, um, that's also not an option because going through uh, an intermediary increases the latency uh, for delivering this content. Uh, and this just doesn't work for them. So they have to do the mitigation themselves. If you do some online uh, voice service that is two-way, it's not broadcast, but it's, it requires two-way two or is interactive, you, you have to do the same thing again. Other questions? Uh huh. Amazon or okay, uh, I'll repeat because I, I didn't think I hear, heard you well. Uh, in terms of DDoS, uh, reflected DDoS, are there any providers that handle that well? Okay, so um, if you're on the receiving end, doesn't matter if it's reflected or if it's direct. In all cases, it's a matter of how much bandwidth you have and if the provider can, can mitigate that. So um, Amazon, for example, you know, does a decent job. You know, Azure does a decent job. Um, now, this question reminded me of another question uh, and a topic that I you know, kind of brushed on, but there are providers like Ecatel in Amsterdam. They would provide you unfiltered uh, outbound uh, access. So if you want to spoof, you can spoof all you want. Uh, so there are certain providers that are, favor that are favorites of the people that do this type of abuse. Other questions? Yes, uh, so um, yeah, that, that's actually a topic I dodged intentionally. Uh, I'll just cover it in a few words and then we can talk more offline. Uh, what happened about four to six weeks ago, um, China, uh, or it was attributed to China, um, and the intention was attributed to China because it was obvious that the traffic is coming from the Great China Firewall. So that was kind of difficult to not attribute properly. However, the intention was also attributed to China was that they um, were injecting uh, pieces of code, um, pieces of JavaScript. It was exactly three packets that were sent um, to customers that were visiting some services within China. The traffic was injected, uh, the JavaScript was injected, and then it would send um, a lot of traffic towards GitHub. 
So in, by injecting JavaScript in the traffic, they were turning all those browsers into drones that were attacking GitHub. Uh, so that's, um, I think this is the first time we're seeing some active, uh, some really active and easily attributable um, um, attack from there. Other questions? Okay, thanks everyone.